In Attack of the Clones, as Senator Padme Amidala arrives on Coruscant to vote on the Military Creation Act, she survives an assassination attempt, which was orchestrated by Count Dooku. And this, of course, led to Padme being placed under the protection of Anakin Skywalker, which in turn caused a relationship to develop between the two. So, in this video, let's imagine an alternate Star Wars timeline where the assassination attempt on Padme was successful, and along with her handmaiden Corday, Padme also died. How would that change things? Let's find out. So in this timeline, like in the original, the ship carrying Corday, who is pretending to be Padme, would blow up immediately after landing. Padme would then run over to Corday, Corday would apologize for doing her job, and then there will be a second explosion, and this one will claim the life of Padme. So naturally, Padme's death would become a serious security concern, and it would fall upon the Jedi to find out who was behind this and to bring them to justice. Mace Yoda, the other masters, and Palpatine would discuss this, and Palpatine would suggest getting Master Kenobi to assist with the investigation. Palpatine may have suggested this to let the dark side grow inside of Anakin, because Palpatine knew how much Anakin cared for Padme. Anyways, after listening to Palpatine's proposal, Mace Windu would say, like he did in the original timeline, that Kenobi has just returned from a border dispute in Anseon, and that the Council will have Kenobi take over this investigation. We then get to Anakin and Kenobi inside the Jedi Temple as they're going to meet with the Council regarding this new assignment of theirs, the murder of Padme Amidala. Anakin would obviously be extremely sad and angry about what happened to Padme, but he wouldn't share any of this with Obi-Wan, but Kenobi would sense it nonetheless. Kenobi would ask Anakin if he was feeling alright, to which Anakin would say, Of course, Master, why would I be sad? Or something along those lines. Kenobi wouldn't need the force to sense Anakin's sarcasm, or wit as he called it. Kenobi would then tell Anakin that he understands what Anakin is going through, and that he remembers what it was like to lose his master, Qui-Gon Jinn. Kenobi would also go on to tell Anakin that Anakin shouldn't let his emotions control his judgement, as that can lead to him making the wrong choices. Anakin would listen to all this and would simply tell Kenobi that he understands. Not long after, the two would meet with the Council, where they will be tasked with finding out who was behind the attack on Padme Amidala. But, unlike in the original timeline, here, Anakin will stay with Kenobi, as Padme is dead and needs no protection. So in this alternate timeline, Obi-Wan and Anakin would begin their investigation by examining the site of the explosion, which by now has a sort of forensic lab built around it as they didn't want to move anything and potentially lose a valuable piece of evidence. Kenobi would then ask the forensic droids if they found anything that could help them, and then the droids would present Kenobi and Anakin with fragments of a strange metal that the droids apparently could not identify. The droids would then tell Kenobi that these fragments may have formed part of the explosive that killed Padme, but that they're not sure. But what the droids are certain about is that these metal fragments did not come from Padme's ship. So all this information would confuse and somewhat disappoint Kenobi, and would also make Anakin slightly angry. But then Kenobi would tell Anakin that he knows someone who could help them identify where these metal fragments came from. And this someone that Obi-Wan speaks of is not Dexter, instead it's Quinlan Was. So Quinlan, in case you don't know, is a Jedi who had a very unique ability known as Psychometry. Now, Psychometry was the Force ability where those who possessed the power could touch an object and get a vision of where it's been, who used it, and a lot of other associated information. It's the same power that Cal Custis has. Anyways, in this alternate timeline, Obi-Wan would take the metal fragments recovered from the side of the explosion to Quinlan, in the hopes that maybe he could shed some light as to where they came from. So Quinlan would obviously agree to help Kenobi, and after examining these metal fragments that Kenobi brought, Quinlan would get a vision. And in this vision, he would see Rain on an ocean planet, a man in Mandalorian armor, his son, this Mandalorian leaving this rainy planet, arriving on Coruscant, and then finally, Quinlan would also see this Mandalorian handing over whatever these metal fragments formed a part of to someone else. And that's pretty much all Quinlan sees. And as for who this someone else was, well that was Zam, the Chlorite shapeshifter that Jango killed in the original timeline. So after receiving all this information from Quinlan, Kenobi would be confused, but at least now, he had something to go off of. Given everything he learned from Quinlan, Kenobi would arrive at the conclusion that the assassination of Padme Amidala was carried out by a Mandalorian. And this Mandalorian was quite possibly acting under the orders of someone else. And then, based on what Quinlan saw in the end, where the Mandalorian handed over what was possibly explosives to someone else, Kenobi would also conclude that this Mandalorian hired yet another assassin to do the job for him. This would confuse Kenobi as to why a Mandalorian would do this, but then he would assume that this Mandalorian did so with the intention of killing this assassin that he hired after the job was done, just so the Mandalorian could cover his tracks better. Anyways, later on, Kenobi would share everything he learned with Anakin, 
who would then tell Kenobi that they should probably examine the security recordings of the site of the explosion. Kenobi would agree, given that the assassin may have been close by when the explosion happened, just to make sure that the job was completed. This, by the way, is a likely possibility because in the original timeline, Django was keeping a very close eye on Zam, which is how he was able to kill Zam before Kenobi and Anakin was able to extract any information from the Chlorite. Anyways, we would then cut to Anakin and Kenobi going through the security recordings, hoping to find something useful. A little while into doing this, after not finding anything, Anakin would tell Kenobi that he doesn't sleep well anymore. Kenobi would then ask Anakin if it's because of Padme, to which Anakin would say that he's been having dreams of his mother, and that he doesn't know why. Kenobi would stay silent for a moment, and then tell Anakin that dreams will pass in time, and that Anakin shouldn't dwell on them. Anakin would then tell Kenobi how he wishes he could dream of Padme instead, just so that he could see her one more time. Sensing the sorrow within his Padawan, Kenobi would tell Skywalker that he shouldn't mourn those who transform into the Force. This of course would not make Anakin feel any better, but he would look at Kenobi and nod in agreement. Kenobi would then prepare to say something to Anakin, but before he could do so, Anakin notices something in the security recordings. So what Anakin saw was that, a short while after the explosion that killed Padme, in the distance, on one of the other buildings, someone can be seen flying up using a jetpack, something that Mandalorians are known to use. So at this point, Kenobi and Skywalker have enough evidence to conclude that the attack on Padme was possibly carried out by a Mandalorian bounty hunter. And based on what Quillen said, they also know that this Mandalorian has something to do with the water world. Kenobi then tells Anakin that if they manage to find this water world, they could find this Mandalorian assassin. Anakin agrees, but Kenobi senses that Anakin has a lot going on in his mind. So, Kenobi would tell Anakin that he, Kenobi, would go see a certain someone that he knows, who could maybe help direct them towards this water world. But Kenobi goes on to say that in the meantime, Anakin should go to the Jedi Temple and get some rest, because Kenobi thinks he needs it. Anakin would disagree, but Kenobi insists. So after sending Anakin away, Kenobi would head over to an industrial section of Coruscant known as Coco Town. He goes there to meet with a friend of his, who goes by Dexter Jetster, who runs the diner there. So Kenobi goes to Dexter with the metal fragments recovered from the explosion, hoping that Dexter might be able to identify where they came from, but unlike in the original timeline, Dexter isn't able to help Kenobi identify Kamino, because in the original timeline, Kenobi took a poison dart that Django used on Zam to Dexter, and Dexter was able to look at this dart and identify it came from Kamino because of the particular kind of cuts on this poison dart. But in this alternate timeline, Kenobi doesn't have anything solid to give to Dexter, all he has are these metal fragments, and using them alone, Dexter was not able to identify where they came from. This would be somewhat disappointing to Obi-Wan, but then Kenobi would go on to tell Dex about this Mandalorian bounty hunter he's been looking for, and that if Dex knows anyone like that. Dex would think for a moment before telling Kenobi that he might know someone who could maybe help Kenobi find this particular Mandalorian. Dex will then tell Kenobi that he will get in touch with this friend of his and that it might take a while to do so. To which Kenobi would say that he'll wait. Dex would laugh and then tell his droid that they're closing early today. In the meantime, Anakin, who had gone back to the Jedi Temple, was in a lot of emotional distress. His mind dwelled on the horrible dreams he was having of his mother. Anakin knew that Jedi could sometimes get visions of the future, so... At this point, Anakin wasn't entirely sure if these were just simple dreams, as Obi-Wan said. In every single dream Anakin was having of his mother, Shmi Skywalker, she was suffering and in great pain. Because of this, a thought would begin consuming Anakin's mind. What if his dreams are actually visions of the future? If that is the case and he chose to do nothing about these visions, his mother would actually suffer as she's suffering in his dreams. Anakin thinks of asking Kenobi for help but decides not to because Anakin didn't think Kenobi would take his concern seriously and would just give him more advice that wouldn't help him. Instead, Anakin would decide to go to Master Yoda with his concerns. So the conversation between Anakin and Yoda regarding Anakin's premonitions would go pretty much the same way it went in Revenge of the Sith. Yoda would ask Anakin who he sees in his dreams, Anakin would say it's someone close to him, Yoda would think about this for a moment and then tell Anakin that these dreams that he's having could be premonitions and that he needed to be very careful while analyzing visions of the future. Anakin would then ask Yoda what he should do, to which Yoda would say that Anakin should train himself to let go of everything he fears to lose, and that acting on visions of the future might actually be a path to the dark side. So at this point, Anakin realizes something. He wasn't going to get any help from the Jedi. They would all just tell him something similar to what Yoda told him. So finally, Anakin would reach the conclusion that if he wanted to save his mother, he'll have to do it himself. So now if we get back to Kenobi and Dex. Dex had actually managed to contact a friend of his regarding Kenobi's Mandalorian situation. So it's not important who this friend of Dex was, but who this friend of Dex's referred Dex to is important. 
because that was Hondo Anaka. If you don't know who that is, pause and read this. So anyways, Dex and Kenobi then contact Hondo, and Kenobi requests Dex to speak with Hondo, because Kenobi was somewhat recognizable. Dex agrees, and not long after, Dexter Jetster was speaking with Hondo Anaka. Dex would tell Hondo that Dex has a client who needs a job done, and that credits were not of concern. And Dex would go on to ask Hondo if it was possible to hire the services of a certain Mandalorian that he's been hearing about. Keep in mind that during this time, Django was known as the best bounty hunter in the galaxy, basically. So people who were involved with the criminal business, I guess, had at least heard of him. And Hondo in particular actually knew Django Fett. So immediately after Dex brought up the Mandalorian bounty hunter, Hondo got a pretty good idea of who Dex was referring to. Hondo would then tell Dex that he might know someone who could help Dex, and then would go on to ask Dex, the specifics of the job that needs to be done. To which Dex would tell Hondo that Dex's client doesn't want to disclose that information to anyone other than the bounty hunter he hires. Hondo would agree to this and would tell Dex that he can arrange a meeting between Dex's client and this Mandalorian bounty hunter. But Hondo would go on to tell Dex that before this meeting can be arranged, he would need some payment as a show of good faith. Dex would of course agree to make this payment because Kenobi had credits, but what Dex and Kenobi didn't know was that none of those credits went to the Mandalorian bounty hunter, but instead to Hondo. Anyways, after the payment is made, Hondo would tell Dex that he would get in touch with this Mandalorian and would inform Dex where Dex's client and this bounty hunter can meet, safely. Dex would ask how long that will take, to which Hondo replies with, Soon, my friend. And with that, Hondo ends transmission. Dex will then tell Kenobi that he will let him know when Hondo gets back to him with the details. Kenobi would then thank Dex for all his help and would head back to the Jedi Temple. Once back at the temple, Kenobi shares what he's learned with Mace Windu and Yoda. And then Yoda would tell Obi-Wan about how Anakin came to him with premonitions. Yoda would then ask Obi-Wan if he knew anything about this, to which Kenobi would say that Anakin had told him about dreams he was having of his mother. Kenobi would tell Yoda that he thought these dreams of Anakin's were nothing more than just normal dreams. To which Yoda would say that it is very likely that Anakin is having visions of the future, and that Anakin needs to be very careful while analyzing these visions. Listening to all this would make Kenobi kinda sad, because he feels as though Anakin trusted Yoda more than him. But quickly dismissing his thoughts, Kenobi would tell Yoda that he will speak with Anakin about his visions. Obi-Wan would then try to find his apprentice in the Jedi Temple, but... He can't seem to locate him. Kenobi would then try to reach Anakin through his comm link, but that too fails. We then cut to Anakin in the sands of Tatooine. Anakin is here because having realized how the Jedi wouldn't be able to save his mother, he took it upon himself to do so. So similar to what happened in the original timeline, here too, Anakin would eventually run into Watto. Watto would actually be kinda happy to see Anakin as a Jedi. Anyways, not long after seeing Watto, Anakin would ask Watto what happened to his mother. To which, like in the original timeline, Watto would tell Anakin that he sold Shmi Skywalker to Klee Lars. Watto would go on to explain how Klee Lars set Shmi Skywalker free and married her, and would also guide Anakin to where they live. And then, Anakin would thank Watto and leave. So a little later, Anakin would show up at the Lars home, and the first thing he sees there would be C-3PO. So 3PO would immediately recognize Anakin, and when Anakin asked 3PO what happened to his mother, 3PO would take Anakin inside to talk with Klee Lars. So inside, Anakin would meet his stepbrother, Owen Lars, his girlfriend, Beru, and finally, Klee Lars, who would explain to Anakin how, roughly two weeks ago, as for me, was returning home after picking mushrooms, she was taken by Tuscan hunters. Lars would go on to tell Anakin that he, along with 30 other people, were looking for Shmi, with only 4 of them returning, and Kleeg having lost one of his legs. Anakin would listen to all of this, and just as he did in the original timeline, would get up and go to rescue his mother. The only difference is that in this timeline, Anakin is on Tatooine a lot earlier than he was in the original. So eventually, with the help of Sanjawas, Anakin would find the Tuscan camp. Anakin would let the Force be his guide, and soon enough, he would find himself being drawn to a particular hut, which had two Tuscans guarding it. Skywalker would then use his lightsaber to get inside this hut, and what he saw inside was shocking. Anakin had found his mother, Shmi Skywalker, tortured and tied up. Seeing this, Anakin quickly cut her loose and tried to wake her up. But right then, a Tuscan raider walked into the hut. Seeing this, Anakin would use the force to push this Tuscan outside the hut, and then, after carefully resting Shmi Skywalker on the floor of the hut, Anakin would make his way outside the hut. Consumed by his anger at this point, Anakin would ignite his blue lightsaber 
and begin the slaughter of the Tuscans. The first victims of Anakin's rage would be the two Tuscans who were guarding the hut. One of the guards would be decapitated, and the other, whom Anakin had pushed away with the Force, would be beckoned towards Anakin's lightsaber by the Force before being sliced in half at the waist. Seeing this, all the other Tuscans would charge at Anakin with their gaffy sticks, which were of course no match for Anakin's lightsaber. So fairly quickly, most of the Tuscans that attacked Anakin were left without their heads. A few others still had their heads, but they were missing a lot of their limbs and were trying to crawl away from Anakin, which Anakin had no intention of letting happen. So Anakin grabbed these dismembered Tuscans using the Force and dragged them towards a giant fire that the Tuscans had lit to cook meat. And now this fire was cooking the Tuscans alive instead of their food. And then immediately after, Anakin noticed a group of Tuscans trying to run away, but Anakin wasn't going to let them escape. So using the Force, Anakin summoned a huge boulder that was lying nearby and then launched it at these Tuscans who were trying to run away from him, instantly crushing them. So by this point, a lot of the Tuscans were dead. The only ones that remained were the women and children who were hiding inside one of the huts. And as Anakin was making his way over to them, he heard something from behind. It was the voice of Shmi Skywalker. She was calling for help, and because of that, Anakin turned his attention away from the Tuscans and went to Shmi Skywalker. So like in the original timeline, Shmi was able to quickly recognize Anakin as her son. But when Shmi tries to speak with Anakin, Anakin would tell his mother to save her strength, and then he would take her back to the Lars home. So in this timeline, unlike in the original, Anakin only killed the men, and left the women and the child Tuscans without harm. But anyways, shortly thereafter, Anakin would arrive back at the Lars home with a severely injured Shmi, and would tell Owen Lars that his mother urgently needed a doctor. We then cut back to Master Kenobi, observing someone in an abandoned section of Coruscant's industrial sector. And as for who Kenobi was observing, well that would be V. Malro. V. Malro was a Padawan, but in this instance, he was disguised as an assistant to the client that wanted to hire the Mandalorian. And as for how Obi-Wan ended up working with V, well, Kenobi couldn't meet with this Mandalorian because he was too recognizable, so Kenobi went to Yoda, told him of this problem, and Yoda recommended that Kenobi take V. Malro to help him with this mission. The reason for this was that unlike Kenobi and Anakin, V. Melru was less recognizable, which made him suitable for this particular mission. So Kenobi and Melru had been waiting for this Mandalorian for quite some time now. Every few minutes or so, Kenobi was asking Melru through the comm link if Melru was seeing anything, and so far the answer had been no. Kenobi was even beginning to wonder if Hondo scammed Dex, because while Hondo had specified the exact location to meet this Mandalorian, he had not mentioned an exact time. All Hondo told Dex was to basically just be at this specific location after nightfall. So suffice to say, Kenobi was pretty frustrated with how things were going. But what frustrated him even more right now was actually Anakin. Anakin had pretty much disappeared, but not before leaving Kenobi a message. In the message, Anakin apologizes to Kenobi for leaving, but tells Kenobi that there was no choice and that he had to go. And then Anakin ends the message by telling Kenobi that he will be back soon. Kenobi had not shared Anakin's message with the other masters, and as all of this was going through his head, Malro contacted Kenobi through his comm link. Kenobi answered and Malro told him that a droid was approaching Malro. Hearing this, Kenobi immediately zoomed in on Malro with his telescope, and Malro was right, a droid was indeed approaching him. It looked similar to a probe droid, and after it got close to Malro, the droid stopped, and then projected a hologram in front of Malro. In the hologram, Malro saw a hooded figure. Was this the Mandalorian assassin they were looking for? Neither Malro nor Kenobi were sure. The figure in the hologram spoke first, asking Malro if he had something for him, to which Malro replied by first introducing himself. But not as Jedi Padawan v Malro of course, but instead as Kylan Marcos, an assistant to a very wealthy Coruscanti art collector. Kylan would then tell this figure inside this hologram that Kylan's boss needs someone to guard a very valuable piece of art as it's being transported from Zepho to Coruscant. Kylan would then tell this figure that he came highly recommended and that credits are not an issue for his boss. Kylan will also ask this figure inside the hologram if he wants his payment in advance, to which the figure would say he only accepts payment after the work is done. And would then ask Kylan when exactly this art piece is being transported. To which Malro or Kylan would say that they're still working out some of the details and that they will let him know very soon. To which the figure in the hologram would say to Kylan to meet him at this exact same location in one standard week. 
Kylin or Malro will agree to this, the transmission will end, and then the droid will float away, just as it came in. Kenobi was pretty disappointed by this because he was expecting the Mandalorian to show up in person, so that Malro could place a tracking device on the Mandalorian, which would have enabled Kenobi to figure out where this Mandalorian came from, and to confirm if he was indeed the person that Quinlan saw in his vision. But all hope was not lost because Malro actually managed to place a tracker on the droid that floated over to him. He did so using his telekinetic force abilities, and the tracker was actually not on him. Instead, it was placed close by, which enabled Malro to place the tracker on the droid without the assassin he was talking to noticing. Also, this was in one of those trackers that had a blinking red light and made a beeping noise every two seconds. Instead, it was actually designed to do its job. So basically, Malro was successful in placing a tracker on the droid, without this bounty hunter noticing. But then, as Kenobi was monitoring the tracking data coming off of this droid, he notices something strange. The droid didn't fly for too long before stopping. Kenobi would then turn his attention to where the droid stopped, he would zoom in with his telescope, and there, Kenobi saw what looked like a man wearing Mandalorian armor next to this droid. So seeing this, Kenobi comes to the conclusion that this bounty hunter was actually close by, and the reason why he was there was probably to see if Malro was an actual client and not someone trying to set him up. But Kenobi had expected this, and to make sure he wouldn't be spotted, Kenobi was using a stealth field generator, which is basically a device that allows its user to essentially cloak themselves, hiding them from being detected. These were rare, but Kenobi being a Jedi was able to get his hands on one with the help of Madame Jocastanu. So because of this, Kenobi wasn't spotted by this bounty hunter, because he most definitely scouted the place before sending that droid over to Malro. So as Kenobi was observing this assassin who was examining this droid, he saw the assassin use his jetpack to fly away after disposing of the droid. Kenobi, not wanting to lose track of this Mandalorian, decided to follow him using a speeder, while keeping a safe distance, of course. And as Kenobi followed this man, he realized that this Mandalorian was actually following Malro, possibly with the intention of making sure he is who he said he is. But luckily, Kenobi and Malro had planned for this, and after his meeting with the Mandalorian, Malro got on a speeder, and then flew all the way to the financial district of Coruscant, eventually stopping at an art gallery and walking inside. The bounty hunter was on Malro's tail until this point, but after seeing him walk into an art gallery, the Mandalorian changed directions, as did Obi-Wan. Eventually, the Mandalorian flies into a building and then flies back out inside a speeder. Kenobi again starts pursuing this Mandalorian bounty hunter who is now inside a speeder, but eventually the Mandalorian starts flying the speeder into some of the more abandoned areas of Coruscant, where there is very little traffic. So Kenobi figures that if he continues chasing this bounty hunter, that might actually cause this bounty hunter to become suspicious, and he, Kenobi, might end up losing the one lead that he has. So with continue to pursue the speeder not being an option, Kenobi considers placing a tracker on the Mandalorian speeder, but he was too far away to do that. So instead, Kenobi contacts the Coruscant security force, who were basically the police force of Coruscant. Kenobi tells them that he needs to know where the speeder is going, and the security force obviously complies with the Jedi's request, and begins tracking the bounty hunter speeder using their many orbital satellites. Kenobi then turns away and tells the security force to keep him updated. So not more than a few minutes after, the security force contacts Kenobi and tells him that the speeder he asked them to track stopped in an abandoned region of the industrial sector, and the speeder's occupant got out of the speeder and got into what appears to be a fire spray that even class patrol and attack craft. Kenobi says that's intriguing, and further request the security forces to place a tracker on this craft as it reaches orbit. Kenobi also requests the security force to do it without stopping this craft, because that might also cause the bounty hunter to become suspicious. The Coruscant security force would tell Kenobi that nothing he said would be a problem, and that they will make sure that the ship is tracked. That too with the tracking device, which self-destructs once the ship that it is on stops. So everything goes as planned, the bounty hunter ship reaches orbit, the security forces place a tracker on it, and then the bounty hunter goes into hyperspace. And now, Old Master Kenobi needed to do, and could do, was to wait. So Kenobi would then go back to the Jedi Temple and share with Mace Windu and Yoda everything he's learned so far from his investigation. And then, eventually, as they were talking, Yoda would bring up the topic of Anakin, because no one had seen Anakin in quite some time. But before Master Kenobi could say anything, he receives a transmission on his comm link from the Coruscant security force. The security force will tell Kenobi that they have the location of where the bounty hunter ship landed. This would immediately distract Obi-Wan and Mace Windu from the topic of Anakin, and even though Master Yoda still had questions about Anakin, he would also sense that Obi-Wan is 
reluctant to share information on Anakin. So Yoda too will follow the other two Jedi in figuring out what this planet is. But when Kenobi looks up the Jedi archives to try and figure out what planet the bounty hunter went to, there would be no planet there. This would be even more concerning to the Jedi because if a planet is not in the Jedi archives, that means someone removed it. But regardless, Kenobi decides to go to this location that the Coruscant security force gave him and find out if that bounty hunter was indeed the person he was looking for. So not long after, Kenobi gets into a starfighter and heads to this mysterious planet. But not before transmitting a message to Anakin's comlink. Also, in case you're wondering, Kenobi didn't know that Anakin was on Tatooine because Anakin had kept his comlink offline. Anyways, in this message that Kenobi sent Anakin, Kenobi goes on to say that he is going to this mystery planet that he found and that he really needs Anakin's help. And that's pretty much all Kenobi says. And along with this message, Kenobi also sends the location of this mystery planet to Anakin. And after that is done, Kenobi sets off to this vault on a starfighter. Anakin, in the meantime, was on Tatooine in the Lars home. His mother was getting better and for the first time in a long time, Anakin was feeling happy. Anakin was even considering leaving the Jedi Order, if he wasn't expelled that is. But then, Anakin thought of Padme and how he needed to find who killed her. So as soon as the thought of Padme crossed his mind, Anakin activated his comm link and saw the message from Kenobi. Anakin was actually feeling somewhat angry towards Kenobi because he dismissed his visions as nothing more than dreams. But pretty quickly, Anakin realized that it wasn't Kenobi that he hated, but the Jedi in general because the Grand Master of the Jedi Order, Yoda, also told Anakin to not act on his visions. But setting all that aside for the time being, Anakin plays Kenobi's message and after hearing everything, Anakin decides to go to this planet that Kenobi went to. But before doing so, Anakin talks to Shmi Skywalker again and tells her that he will be back very soon. Shmi would tell Anakin that she is extremely proud of him and that she will be waiting for him. And also, before Anakin leaves, the Lars family also thanks Anakin because after Anakin killed all the Tuskens, at least the men, the Tuskens learned their lesson and have moved away from the moisture farms. So Anakin essentially taught the Tuskens a lesson, much like how Klee Lars wanted to do in the novelization of Attack of the Clones. Anyways, basically Shmi Skywalker and the Lars family bid farewell to Anakin and Anakin heads over to the coordinates that Kenobi sent. We then get to Kenobi arriving on this mystery planet and finding it to be a planet similar to what Quinlan had described. And this planet is, of course, Kamino. So Kenobi gets to Kamino and everything would play out similar to how it did in the original timeline. Kenobi would arrive on Kamino, he would then meet Tanwi, who would tell Kenobi that the Kaminoans have been waiting for the Jedi to show up for quite some time now. And then Tanwi would take Kenobi to the Prime Minister of Kamino, Lamasu, and the Lamasu will tell Kenobi that they have 200,000 clones ready to go, with a million more on the way. Saying the confused Kenobi, Lamasu would explain that this clone army was ordered by Jedi Master Sifo Dyas, who by this point has been dead for 10 years. If you want to know more about Sifo Dyas, pause and read this. And after being told by Kenobi that Sifo Dyas has been dead for quite some time, Lamasu, the Prime Minister of Kamino, would tell Kenobi that this army was ordered by Sifo Dyas for the Republic. Anyways, eventually, after being shown all the clone troopers that they have produced, the Kaminoans would tell Kenobi that the genetic template for all the clones came from a bounty hunter called Django Fett. And after being told that Django is actually there on Kamino, Kenobi would request to see him. And then, Don Wee would take Kenobi to Django Fett. Django, meet Larry Kenobi. He flew in all the way from Coruscant. Django is our lead chemist. So the meeting between Kenobi and Django would go similar to how it went in the original timeline. Kenobi would strongly feel that this man, Django Fett, is the person behind Padme Amidala's death, especially after Kenobi saw his son, which matches with what Quinlan saw in his vision, a Mandalorian and his son. But unlike in the original timeline, here, Kenobi would not see Django's Mandalorian armor, because it's unlikely that Django just leaves that thing lying around all the time. So basically, in this meeting, Kenobi would ask Django if he's made his way to Coruscant anytime recently. Django would say, perhaps. Django would then assure Kenobi that the clones would do their job, and then Kenobi would bow and leave Django. After this conversation, Kenobi would almost be convinced that Django is indeed this Mandalorian bounty hunter he's been looking for, and Django would also become convinced that this Jedi is onto him, and therefore would tell Boba, his son, to pack his things so that they could leave to Geonosis. Kenobi would then contact Yoda and Mace Windu on Coruscant and tell them everything he's learned about the clone army, how Master Sifo Dyas ordered it for the Republic 10 years ago, and finally how he tracked Jango Fett and how Kenobi believes that this Jango Fett is indeed the Mandalorian bounty hunter he was looking for. Yoda would tell Kenobi to bring in this Jango Fett for questioning and then the transmission would end. And then after this, the fight between Jango and Kenobi would go up pretty much the same. 
with the fight ending the Django flying off and Kenobi placing a tracker on the slave water. But unlike in the original timeline here, the difference is that as soon as Django leaves, Anakin shows up on Kamino. Anakin and Kenobi didn't talk much seeing as how they needed to follow Django urgently, so all Kenobi would tell Anakin is that Django might be the person they were looking for and then the two Jedi would follow Django. And eventually, Anakin and Kenobi would arrive on Geonosis. But in this timeline, unlike in the original, there won't be a battle about Geonosis between Django and Kenobi. Because here, due to Anakin showing up, Kenobi took a little longer to follow Django. So Django didn't see Kenobi follow him when Django arrived on Geonosis. So in this timeline, both Anakin and Kenobi, after landing on Geonosis, would sneak into the Geonosian droid factory. And there, they will see Count Dooku as he's talking to Viceroy Gunray, and Kenobi and Anakin would listen as Gunray tells Dooku that he is pleased with the death of Amidala, to which Dooku would say that he's a man of his word. So at this point, it is clear to Kenobi and Anakin who was responsible for Padme's death. Dooku orchestrated it due to Gunray's wishes. So hearing all of this, a rage would start consuming Anakin, but before Anakin could leap into his death, Kenobi would stop him and tell Anakin that they cannot risk getting captured. Because if they die, Coruscant would never find out about what happened. Anakin would listen and give up his plans of trying to take on Dooku right then and there. Which had he done so, he would have probably been defeated. But right then, Dooku would stop walking as if he heard something or felt something. Skywalker and Kenobi would see this and would stay motionless. And a moment later, Dooku would start walking again with the Separatists. And Anakin and Kenobi would follow Dooku. They end up following Dooku into a meeting Dooku is having with the other Separatists. And from this meeting, Anakin and Kenobi figures out how the Confederacy of Independent Systems, or CIS, plans to use the droid army to take on the Republic. And after learning all these valuable bits of information, Kenobi and Anakin would make their way out, back to their starfighters. And once there, Kenobi would try to transmit a message to Coruscant from Geonosis, but unfortunately Coruscant is too far away. But Kenobi keeps trying, asking R4 to widen the range, and as this is happening, Anakin was scanning the surrounding area to make sure that no one was watching them. And as Anakin was doing so, he sees a Geonosian in the distance looking at them. And quickly, without even thinking, Anakin pulls this Geonosian closer to him and cuts him in half with his lightsaber. This startles Kenobi who looks at Anakin and senses the rage within Anakin. And then Kenobi would tell Anakin that they cannot send a transmission to Coruscant from Geonosis and that they should leave before they get captured. Anakin complies and both Anakin and Kenobi leave Geonosis unnoticed back to Coruscant. So once Kenobi and Skywalker reach Coruscant, they would immediately share everything they learned about the CIS's droid army with the Masters and the Chancellor who is secretly orchestrating all this. So after hearing all this, the Jedi and some senators, including Bail Organa, would arrive at the conclusion that the Republic needs to use this clone army to defend itself against the CIS's droid army. But unfortunately, the Republic Senate was still not done debating the Military Creation Act, which by the way was the bill that Padme Amidala came to Coruscant as the Senator of Naboo to vote on before she was killed. So with the debates not done, the Military Creation Act cannot be voted on, but the Republic immediately needed to be able to use this clone army. So this is where the manipulation of junior representative Jar Jar Binks comes into play. So in case you don't know, a junior representative of the Republic Senate is an individual representing a sector of their homeworld. So while Padme Amidala was representing the entire planet of Naboo, Jar Jar Binks was a junior representative because he represented the interests of the Gungans. And also, if a senator from a world was unavailable to perform their duties, the junior representative could do this in their stead. So in this alternate timeline as well, like in the original, due to Padme Amidala not being there to fulfill her duties, Representative Binks could perform her duties in her stead. And he also had all her powers in the Senate. So that's essentially what a junior representative can do. So let's get back to the manipulation of Jar Jar Binks. So this would go exactly as it did in the original timeline. So as the Jedi, Bail Organa, and Jar Jar are all standing around confused as to what they should do, Masa Meta would say that the only way the Republic could approve the use of the clone army was by giving emergency powers to the Supreme Chancellor, who was Shiva Palpatine, aka Darth Sidious. Then, after Masa Meta says this, Palpatine would ask what senator would have the courage to propose such a motion in the Senate. And then he goes on to say that if Padme Amidala were here, she could have helped them. All of this obviously affects Jar Jar, who by the way now has all of Padme Amidala's powers. So poor Jar Jar, believing that he was saving the Republic essentially, proposes a motion in the Republic Senate 
to grant emergency powers to the Supreme Chancellor so that he could approve the Military Creation Act and the Republic could start using the Clone Army. So by this point in the timeline, Palpatine had pretty much won because he was now essentially the head of both the Republic and the CIS. So regardless of who won, she would be the one in control of whatever was left. So basically like 80% of Palpatine's job was done right here. All thanks to junior representative Jar Jar Binks. But Jar Jar alone cannot be blamed for the rise of Palpatine because two of the most powerful members of the Jedi High Council were also there and they didn't protest to this. So everyone shares a bit of blame for what happened. Anyway, he says all this is happening, Kenobi and Anakin would get some time to talk and discuss everything Anakin went through on Tatooine. Anakin would tell Kenobi that his dreams were actually premonitions and that he managed to save his mother from certain death because of his dreams, as Kenobi put it. Kenobi would apologize to Anakin, and Anakin would accept this apology because, like I said before, even Master Yoda, the wisest of the Jedi, told Anakin to not act on his visions. And because of this, Anakin at this point had a strong desire to leave the Jedi Order, but not until this issue with Padme's death was resolved. Kenobi would then ask Anakin why he didn't tell anything about going to Tatooine, even after he went there. To which Anakin would say that even he wasn't 100% sure that his dreams were actually anything more than just simple dreams. But even though Anakin said this, Kenobi would sense from Anakin that the actual reason why Anakin didn't tell Kenobi anything was because he didn't trust him. Kenobi would feel really bad about this and feel as though that he failed Anakin in his training. Because Kenobi felt that his solo master, Qui-Gon Jinn, would have handled the situation a lot better. But before Kenobi could say anything, Mace and Yoda would walk in, informing Kenobi and Anakin that the Military Creation Act has been approved by the Supreme Chancellor after he was given emergency powers, and that the Jedi immediately needed to take possession of this army. So to do this, Yoda and Mace would tell Kenobi that they should go to Kamino. And so the three Jedi Masters and Anakin would head on over to Kamino, and once there, they will meet with Lamassu, the Prime Minister of Kamino, and would then take a battalion of clone troopers over to Geonosis to launch a surprise attack on Dooku. So in the original timeline, in the Battle of Geonosis, 183 Jedi died out of the 212 that showed up. But here, in this alternate timeline, due to the clones being with the Jedi, the battle would go much smoother for the Jedi. But Palpatine did know that the Jedi were about to take the clones to Geonosis, and he had told as much to Dooku. But he also told Dooku to not act on this information because Palpatine did not want anyone thinking that there was a CIS spy among them. And Tyrannus, Dooku of course, obeys his master and stays there on Geonosis. And then, not long after, the Jedi and the clones would arrive, and the CIS droids will start fighting the Republic clones. And like in the original timeline, when the clones showed up, it became obvious to the CIS that their droid army was no match. And similarly, in this alternate timeline, as soon as the Jedi show up with the clones, it becomes obvious to the CIS that their droid army was no match for these clones. Jango realizes this and takes his son and leaves Geonosis, not because he was afraid to die, but because he didn't want his son growing up all alone. So in this timeline, Jango doesn't die, but instead leaves Geonosis with his son. And as for Count Dooku, or Darth Tyrannus, as the Jedi and the clones were fighting off the CIS droids, Dooku tries to escape to Coruscant, like he does in the original timeline. Kenobi would spot this, but with the other masters, mainly Yoda and Mace, occupied with leading the clone troopers, that will leave just Anakin and Kenobi to go after Count Dooku. And so, Skywalker and Kenobi, with some clones, would get on one of the clone transports and would chase after Count Dooku. And eventually, after sustaining some damage from Dooku's forces, Anakin and Kenobi, along with some of the clones, follow Dooku to his hideout, where he planned to leave to Coruscant from. But unfortunately, right after Anakin and Kenobi make their way out of the transport, the transport is attacked by more droids and destroyed with every single clone inside of it. So Anakin and Kenobi end up having to deal with Dooku alone, just like in the original timeline. So as Kenobi and Anakin confront Dooku, their conversation would go quite different than how it did in the original timeline. Dooku would start off by telling Kenobi how it's a pity that they've never met before, because Qui-Gon Jinn, Kenobi's master, was Dooku's apprentice. To this, Kenobi, with his lightsaber drawn, would tell Dooku that Qui-Gon Jinn would be ashamed of him. Dooku would then tell Kenobi that he doesn't fully understand what's going on. And Dooku would then further go on to tell Kenobi that the Senate is under the control of a dark lord of the Sith called Darth Sidious. Kenobi and Anakin would think this is ridiculous because if a Sith lord was so close to them, the Jedi would have sensed it. Dooku would then say that the vision of the Jedi has been clouded by the dark side and that they cannot see much of anything these days. 
and also how Dooku knows of this because Vice Star Gunray told him as much. In case you don't remember, Newt Gunray was acting under the orders of Darth Sidious in Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. And after the Federation lost the war, apparently Gunray went to Dooku for help and told him everything about Darth Sidious. At least that's what Dooku would tell Kenobi. But Kenobi and Anakin, although confused by all this, wouldn't buy into this and would draw their lightsabers and approach Dooku. Also, in this alternate timeline, unlike in the original, Anakin wouldn't try to attack Dooku alone. Instead, he would listen to Kenobi. So because of this, due to Anakin and Kenobi attacking Dooku at once, they were actually able to match Count Dooku. But the Jedi and his Padawan would sense that Dooku was more powerful than them. But luckily for Kenobi and Anakin, Master Yoda, who had sensed that Kenobi and Anakin was in trouble, arrives to deal with Dooku. So now, realizing that he might be defeated, and captured, Dooku destroys the plans for the Death Star that he had with him because that was a closely guarded secret and Dooku could not risk it getting into the hands of the Jedi. So then the duel would begin, but ultimately, Dooku wouldn't be able to hold his own against Kenobi, Anakin, and Yoda. So here the fight would go on for longer, giving enough time for a transport full of clone troopers to show up. So the clones would show up, point their blaster rifles at Dooku. So Dooku, now realizing that there's no possible way he could fight off Yoda, Kenobi, Anakin, and a whole bunch of clone troopers, surrenders. And at this point, I'll be ending part 1 of this fanfiction. Stay tuned because eventually I will make part 2. What if Count Dooku was captured?